Forget the Galaxy Fold. We want IBM's unbelievable folding smartwatch. You see that, Will? Mm. See that right there? Oh. That's what you need to fold, your watch. Forget about the folding iPad, folding Galaxy Fold smartphone, Mate X. No. If the future is folding, that's what it looks like. Do you believe me? No, you don't. Very don't cool. lie to the people. It looks cool, but it's not going to happen. I'm telling you right now. Uh, this story, I'm reading it on Digital Trends, but it looks like the watermark on the actual concept images from Let's Go Digital. These, based on a recent patent filing from IBM, who, as you know, basically out of the hardware business, sold the laptop ThinkPad department to Lenovo. They don't even make products, but they're like, we're still going to patent stuff. And they patent a ton, which I came to discover, including this, which is now making the rounds. It's in the news feed. And for good reason, because we're all, everyone's trying to imagine the future communicator. Everyone's trying to imagine the next thing after the smartphone as we know it right now. Everybody loves the term wearable. How many times are you hearing that? Well, you know, out in the street, wearable, this and that. San Francisco, uh, San Jose. Silicon Valley, what are they saying? Wearables. They're saying wearable, man. You know, that's what they love. They feel like it should be on the body as close to integrated as possible. Cyborg status. The watch is close. Smart watches, they didn't really do it. Not like the people wanted. It wasn't a Dick Tracy moment, you know? Mm. So IBM... With their uh, patent filing addiction, they added one to the roster here. Now, if anybody wants to make something quite like this, uh, I guess IBM gets to bank on some easy money, just drawing up a little patent. Maybe that's part of their business at this point. Now, the way that this particular foldable watch is specced out is kind of an origami-type situation. So it's small watch size, and then it scales up to something, at least phone size, right on your wrist. There are some seams in it because they look like independent displays that unfold and then kind of merge together, almost like a multi-monitor setup you might have at your desk. Like if you have two displays next to each other and then it maps out extended desktop, that's kind of how this implementation appears. Now to me, I'm like, is this heavy? Am I touching? It looks flimsy. It's, it's more questions than answers with this particular product. And there's a, there's a, obviously in all likelihood, you never see this exact thing, but it doesn't stop people from dreaming, from trying to project the future. And I appreciate that. You know, because we didn't get science fiction the way it was promised, not yet. The flying car, it ain't there, Will. You know, you know what's a weird one that science fiction mostly missed was the internet. We talked about this before. Like the most transformative thing I would say, the most transformative futuristic thing that we're dealing with, living with the internet. Yeah. And yet all the science fiction material we had focused on hardware and flying cars and uh, majorly popul populated post-apocalyptic looking uh, a lot of ads ads the future was ads yeah did the Jetsons have a lot of ads though I don't know the Jetsons they had some good tech too cartoon tech you know yeah they had the robot in the house was doing the cleaning the flying saucer vehicle they were living in space so that's yeah. already pretty good on its own as well i mean they had stuff going on but like star trek they didn't go they weren't googling something no you know what i'm saying there was no internet really they had everything was internal all the systems they weren't really communicating with you. Right, someone for, who watches star trek is gonna like correct me right now you're gonna be like they had the interdimensional top-down system from the galaxy of baritone you see how that works well because there's they did so many episodes they probably actually referenced something like the internet yeah, at some point yeah. do you know how many episodes of uh star trek are out there Seventeen thousand. you don't believe <laughs> no. me neither I don't, I don't believe myself on that there's a lot of seasons so. somebody's gonna look it up Quite no ne never mind seasons. seasons well it's like a next, lot of generations it, it, yes yeah. and it's like you know? And they had novels, too. What are some of the special ones that came out after? It's like... It's like... Star Trek... Voyager. 
Yeah. You see, I had got that. Yeah. I was worried for a second. Voyager. <laughs> was that like a cheaper knockoff? I don't know. Next Generation is the one I remember. Picard. Mm -hmm. he, he, Picard never lost his cool. Did he? <laughs> I don't know. Not I, do you uh, think Picard was inspired by Professor X? In some cases, yeah. I mean, he was a leader. He was calm. I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm way out of my league, guys. I, I mean, I'm saying based on a cartoon. I don't even know what came out first. I would say Professor X existed before Picard. Did he have a mental thing? Could he do stuff with the brain? Nothing. Well, he was he was smart. He was smart. He was he wasn't telekinetic. Anyway, you know what? Actually, I watched the Star Trek uh, outtakes thing on YouTube. It's like all the out the best outtakes from the mm. show. It's hilarious. Highly recommended. Anyhow, uh, so so yeah. Apparently, um, IBM is addicted to concept patent filings where they take some outlandish um, patent and and they register it just so they're ready just in case. And I assume they sell, if anyone tries to make something, they, they, maybe they try to license it or make a, make a few bucks off of it at some point. <clears throat> and uh, this is another example of that. So this thing's floating around your newsfeed, I'm sure, but I don't think you're ever gonna see Hmm, maybe in your lifetime, maybe something close, but it ain't coming anytime soon. Don't hold your breath. So uh, on its web, oh, by the way, on its website, it proudly trumpets that it has led the U.S. in patent registration for 26 years with 9,100 patents filed in 2018 alone. So they are obsessed with patents, as the article uh, stipulates here on digital trends. Obsessed with patents. There's got to be some advantage to that. Uh... But to a certain extent, is that kind of uh, manipulating the patent system if you have no intent in actually manufacturing the thing and you're just getting out way ahead of it? Like, is there... I mean, I guess you have to decide on that. I, I suppose if you can draft up something possible and you're, it's your... Uh, you can prove your, your, your imagination is the source of it, then you shall be uh, granted a patent. I'll grant you a patent. Mm -hmm. I have that authority. You didn't know that. Oh, really? I gr whatever you want to do, Willie do, I grant you a patent on that. Immediately? Right now. Oh, okay. As it stands, I grant you all the patents you could ever possibly need <clears throat> for your various projects that you're working on. And trust me, they are they are many. You got a lot you got a lot going on, Will. Uh, People don't even know. You know, like that paper airplane company. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still working on it, but uh <laughs> keep it under wraps for now. It's really innovative. It's a paper airplane store. And it's unbelievable. I mean, they can scale. Mm -hmm. Different yeah. types of paper. They can scale. You know. Did I get you on that one, Jack? It was, it was so <laughs> stupid that it got you. Different colors. The, the papers got you. The different type of paper. Okay. Well done, Jack. Uh, Microsoft prototype Xbox controllers for phones look ideal for xCloud. It's just a research project for now, says Tom Warren on The Verge. These look cool, actually. Uh, what we're looking at is a prototype of a mobile controller to deal with the potential, the future, the likely uh, future in which gaming happens via the cloud. Everyone's banking on it, talking about it. Uh, Microsoft apparently internally suggesting that the success of the Nintendo Switch seems to indicate that there is still a demand, a hunger, for a tactile gaming experience on the go. For actual buttons, Will. What do you think about buttons? I think it's cool. You're a big button guy? Yeah. I yeah, love, me too. I love buttons. Me too. I mean, when it comes to gaming on a smartphone, it's driving me nuts. Like, if you're trying to play any kind of... You have to of, feel it out. Yeah. It's... Uh, I mean, I guess I feel the same way about a tactile keyboard. There's certain circumstances in which buttons are a very satisfying thing to interact with. Uh, gaming is one of those circumstances. So they are showing off a prototype controller that's obviously very inspired from the from the pre-existing Microsoft controller for Xbox, except it splits in the middle and a phone can slide in between the two. Now, there have been products like this in the past. In fact, I've looked at them. I believe I looked at the device called Game Vice. 
at one time, once upon a time in Unbox Therapy history, I looked at a product called Game Vice. Actually, a couple versions of it, I think. But the one that I looked at was for the iPad, and it had a sort of a spring motion in the center. You would extend it, and then the screen would fit into the middle. Essentially like a Nintendo Switch, but for your own mobile device. And that's what Microsoft is experimenting with at the moment. It looks like there's two different versions of the controller, or at least uh, attachments for it. If you scroll down in this article, Will, you can see the whole thing is modular. So the thumb pieces can be detached from the handles for an experience like an iPad experience or maybe a more portable experience as detailed in the uh, in the prototype paperwork here via Microsoft. And uh, it's, no, it's no secret as of right now that Microsoft themselves, as well as Sony, uh, the, the Google stuff with Stadia, like uh, these companies are, are your, your sort of traditional game console companies are starting to take the idea of gaming in the cloud more seriously and they're preparing for it through uh, prototyping devices like this. For me, I think this, this, is a, this is a big, important piece. Now, I understand that these third party devices exist. So if you have one of these things, you're like, hey, I don't, I'm already, I've already been doing this, playing mobile games with uh, my game vice or my Ion iCade mobile or my game case. There, you, you, you know, you could say uh, that those that those have kind of done the trick up until now. But the problem with those is that there's no, you're, you're, you have to map them. They're, they're, they only work with certain games out of the box. They need to map them for the controls of other games. And it's just, it's a bit of a headache. So if you had this mobile gaming platform, uh, Microsoft specific or Google specific or whatever it happens to be, to have the accessory to go, go with it that immediately works with all the titles correctly, similar to the console experience, and as designed by the company behind the platform, it's gonna be a lot more seamless and easier to pick up and sort of trust that it's gonna work the way that you work the way a more typical, like a console works. And, and that's confidence inspiring. So we saw in Google's announcement with the Stadia, the controller was a big piece of it. They're like, hey, we did this controller. We got the controller. We didn't do a console. We did a controller because the console is whatever device you have on you, but we want to make sure we can control certain aspects of your experience through how you input what your input device looks like. And so they they developed this controller with a dedicated Stadia button. There, of course, was the assistant button built right onto it too because that's going to be a big part of their platform. Microsoft can do something similar. And the advantage Microsoft has is that there's already a customer base who's who's uh, uh, well acquainted with the pre-existing console hardware. So for them to just move to this kind of controller inspired by similar feel and so forth, that's a big play. That's a big move. Now, it's just a prototype at the moment, but it's exciting because I think for me, it's, it's one of the things that held me back from taking mobile gaming seriously is just the, 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 the fatigue in the hands and the only games I really enjoyed on mobile then became kind of ones that required different input. Like I think, uh, what was that one? What's the one with, it, with the cool soundtrack? Is it Monument Valley? Is that? Am I, am I crazy yeah. on this? What was that one game? Show me what that looks like, by the way, Monument Valley. I it's mean, like the isometric. <laughs> Whoa, you, there's an actual Monument Valley in Utah, which we'll look up instead. Yeah, this. Yeah, this yeah. game. I, I played like like games like this, which are totally different uh, builds, the totally different input style, puzzle-based, uh, tower defense games, things like this, which are sort of more designed for touch, were the ones that made sense to me. If it, if it became more of a console-style console, console style input, let's say a racing game or a shooting game or something, I just wished I would be on a console with the actual analog thumbsticks and buttons and triggers and all the rest of it. So this can absolutely uh, bridge that gap, and I think it's a cool area for them to be, to be working on. Now, keep in mind, what Microsoft can also do is just make the, the, their current Elite controller, their Xbox controller, compatible with these mobile devices. Because then, like you know, on a PC, for example, you can use their controller as it stands. You start to use these on your Android device or your iPhone or whatever, and if you prop it up, like, and there's all kinds of stands for the iPad and stuff, and then use this controller for the, for the cloud uh, gaming experience. You're good there as well. So lots of options, cool to see. 
I, I'm just, I, it's kind of cool that consoles are still around, to be honest, still kicking, because it was a big part of my, you know, big part of my origin story and how I got into gaming in the first place, at least in a big way. We talked about in a past episode, Gran Turismo, early days, NES before that. Uh, you just like the idea, you boot up the game, you're ready to go. You sit on the couch, Will. Mm -hmm. There's something about sitting on the couch that just the PC gaming never did for me. Do you know? I've been, I tried out the, uh, the Spider-Man game this morning. Okay. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man. Mm. It's open world. Oh, game. yeah. I heard that one's really good. It's, uh, it's vast. It's cool to be uh, Spider-Man in a vast area. You know, you're in, what is it, New York City? He's in New York City, right? Yep. Yeah, of course. And uh, it's hard. There's some stealth. I mean, you can set the difficulty level, but it can be really hard if you want it to. And you set the, uh, you set the, uh, you, do, you, you can do certain, like, there's certain parts where you have to use stealth to succeed and then other parts where you use aggression, different suits. It's a, it's a very elaborate, extensive game. But anyway, you sit on the couch and there's nothing better than, you know, you get to a cut scene and you're just on the couch, just relaxing. You grab a snack or something. It's a, more of a social kind of situation compared to the PC gaming experience, which is, which is only, which is very singular. You, you only really do that by yourself. You won't be on a couch with other people kind of doing it. And that's the experience I had with, with uh, this game this morning. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Now, speaking of game consoles, Microsoft, Sony, and Nintendo now are looking into moving production out of China. So we, we I mean, we've, we've spoken extensively about the issues, the tariff issues, uh, China US issues going on trade issues and so forth now at uh, the last time I talked about it Nintendo specifically was thinking about it now it looks like it's actually happening this transition and Microsoft and Sony are taking part uh, each in their own in their own kind of way uh, Nintendo has confirmed its plans to move a portion of its switch manufacturing out of China now the reason it's a portion well first of all is to diversify their manufacturing uh, footprint, but but also to start with the important the important volume, which is the volume destined for the U.S. Because if they can just move that portion to a different country that doesn't have the trade stipulation, the tariff on there, then essentially they can sell their products for twenty five percent less. That that'll be twenty five percent. They'd just be giving straight to Trump, and, or, or they'd have to put onto the bottom line and just increase the cost of the console. Now, competitively, that's problematic because let's say Nintendo doesn't move their production and they just tack on the extra 25%. Now, Microsoft and Sony have an advantage. Or let's say on the flip side, um, Microsoft is unwilling to move some of their production out of China, then Sony and Nintendo have the advantage. So if one moves, they all gotta move because then they all compete so closely and there's this sort of slim difference in how people select, particularly between Microsoft and Sony, when you're thinking Xbox or you're thinking PlayStation. So a 25% swing in either direction could, price-wise, could be enough to send you in the other direction. So one, one moves, they all gotta move. So the partial move for Nintendo, they're gonna be moving to Vietnam. And uh, in the case of Microsoft and Sony, I believe they're going to be moving to uh, Thailand and Indonesia. So uh, in, in, in the industry, the entire industry's case, you're looking at about 30% of the overall production for these consoles destined for the United States. So that's the percentage makeup of their business. It's a big percentage, right? Uh, obviously, the U.S. is still a major consumer of goods, the major consumer of goods in most cases in a lot of categories. And so it's causing all kinds of problems. You, you have to assume that they're going to incur extra costs just moving production. So they may be able to avoid the 25% tariff, but you're still probably going to see more expense on your end as a U.S. customer just by nature of the fact that you got to go set up some new facility, hire new people. There's just costs of moving that are going to probably end up coming out of your wallet to some degree. So these three companies now join PC makers such as HP, Lenovo, Asus, Dell, and more that are doing the same things. They started out talking about it and now it's been too long. It's been going on too long, it's too threatening, and they can't be at the whim of these political policies. So they gotta do what companies do 
and and sort of spread themselves out and and uh, diversify their strategy so that they could be protected or insulated from these swings in one direction or the other. It's a smart move. You're probably going to pay a little bit more for this stuff regardless, as I just stated, but it's uh, they're just stuck for the time being. They're in limbo waiting for uh, Trump to, to, to change or maybe not. Maybe this is the, the future of the planet for the time being is that maybe these other countries uh, absorb this overflow uh, absorb the U.S. production for these various companies. And if you're in Vietnam right now, if you're in Indonesia, if you're in uh, uh, ta it's Taiwan, Thailand, you're, 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 you're welcoming this business with open arms. What, this is big business. This is big money. These are the biggest brands in the world you're attracting now. So you have to wonder from a political standpoint what kind of friction can be uh, at play now between those countries, because as you know, they're all in the same region. They share borders in many cases. Mm -hmm. And how are they going to feel that, that 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 these companies can essentially just sidestep the the, the, the the trade deadlock through tactics like this and negate the effects of it? You see, on, on, on both sides, like China loses the business. U.S. customers hypothetically pay more. So they both suffer to a certain degree. And what are they, what's the outcome? Do, do, do the U.S. customers pull back? Does China become more aggressive? Do they change their tone and back down? There's a lot that has to take place based on information like this. But we've talked about it a lot. It's now the game consoles, but it's all hardware. It's everything made in China. Get ready for it. It's actually happening. It's not speculation anymore. Factories are moving. Uh, production is moving. Mm-hmm. You got something to say there, Will? You got a little smirk going on. What do you got? No, nothing. Yeah, you do. I'm just thinking like all these companies are just moving away from China. It's uh, it's a pretty bad look, you know, um, with this whole tariff situation. It's like, okay, like all of these manufacturers. All just these leave China. Yeah, are just leaving. It's just like. You're oh. saying China loses the most. Yeah. Obviously. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. China loses the most, but do, but they got two ways to go. They either soften up or double down. What are they going to do? I don't see them softening up at this point. It's got to get worse. I think that they might become like so solitary. Like, yeah, everything's going to be manufactured within China, and then that's it. Like all their companies, and then you're saying it's risky to yeah. isolate yourself. Yeah, from yeah, the, yeah. from the global market. Well, hey man, that's the risk. We got to wait and see. I don't know why that's funny. It's just. I had a smirk. Yeah, it's a weird thing to smirk about. Well, this is people's livelihoods. I apologize. Their lives, their futures. Uh, a lot of people affected here, Will. Let's, uh, let's not laugh about that, yeah. okay? Elon Musk puts kibosh on hopes of refreshed Model S and X vehicles. This is a funny story because do you guys know uh, Brandon Harvard who works for Marquez for MKBHD? Mm -hmm. He tweeted at Elon Musk asking when the Model S or X are going to be updated. And it turned into a news story <laughs> because Elon responded. And if he responds, you got yourself a news story. So he says, so like at Elon Musk, when's the refreshed Model X coming? Asking for a friend, joking around, playful. And then Elon responds, there is no refreshed Model X or Model S coming. Only a series of minor ongoing changes. Most significant change in past few years was to use high efficiency Model 3 rear drive unit as SX front drive unit. That went into production three months ago. Okay. So then Brandon follows up with, will we be seeing an interior revamp anytime soon though? Appreciate the reply. To which Elon responds again at some point. Maybe if you click on that tweet. Yeah, just click on that one. He, no. Just a straight no. On the internet, uh, on the internet, will they call that savage? Oh, is really, that what they call? On the internet, though, in real life, you would never say that. That would yeah. be terrible. And then uh, uh, Brandon says, "Honestly, honesty, honestly, is appreciated." I think he meant to say honesty, but he he, he typed out honestly is appreciated. Thanks, man. And uh, so anyhow. There's some uh, Tesla's taking some heat for this because, of course, it goes into the it goes into the publications that report on this kind of stuff, tech websites, car websites, 
uh, the typical refresh cycle for a car, luxury car, something like this, about four years, they redo it, right? And part of the reason for that is because buyers in this category that are spending this kind of money on cars, they want to get new cars, right? They want to refresh their car every once in a while. And they want to see something new, have the thrill of buying a new vehicle. But the for the take, for example, the Model S, which has been, been out for a really long time, it hasn't changed all that tangibly. It had the original refresh where they redid the grill on the front. But beyond that, it's more or less the same vehicle as it ever has been. And as you see, like Elon referencing, hey, we moved the, the drive unit over here. It's like very minimal types of updates uh, compared to the rest of the industry and the refresh cycle that the rest of the industry is on. Now, it's also interesting the way that he said they're not going to do it. He didn't say, hey, we have plans, but not quite yet. He just said straight no, which is like leaves a lot open to the imagination about the intent as to whether or not he's going to keep innovating on these particular models. And that's important, Will, because as you know, Tesla always getting a lot of uh, attention from a stock market perspective. Wall Street always looking at Tesla as a key indicator, important company. Uh, Model S and X have been on a downhill slide for a while. When they're talking about record Tesla sales, in the, in the recent news stories, it's almost all because of Model 3. Model 3 is doing well. The most affordable. Most affordable, but also the most modern. Oh, if you yeah. step inside a Model... Oh, yeah, the dash. Yeah, uh, if you step inside a Model 3, it feels way more futuristic than a Model S. It's so much cleaner. The display is in, in landscape mode. Uh, they just cleaned it up. They, they made it feel like a car from the future. Like if you like, if you went into a time machine, you woke up, you know, or I don't know why you're sleeping in a time machine, but let's say you fell asleep, Will, and you woke up five years in the future. The Model 3, I think, is the closest thing to like you would step inside and be like, whoa, yeah. five right. years later, there's, there's no traditional looking gauge cluster. It's just this wood trim, this crazy simplified setup. So... A lot of people were hoping that the Model S would adopt this interior. You'd think, okay, you're you're currently making the this, this that same interior for the Model 3, just slap it into the to the Model S. But no, the Model S has this portrait mode display, which is a bit awkward. It has a it has a screen in the position where you would normally have your gauge cluster. It just it just feels a bit more 1.0. Like the first version, the first attempt right. at the futuristic car. And so people, I think Model S, Model X owners are a little bit jealous of the Model 3 being kind of the better car, even though it's way less money than what they have. And, and of course, the X, maybe some people might want a bigger vehicle, same in the, in the, in the category of the, of the S, but the sales numbers don't lie. People are gravitating towards the 3 and they're easing up on the uh, on the S and the X. This is according to the website. Uh, this is Ars Technica, but it was also reported on Electrek, which they report specifically on the electric vehicle uh, department specifically. So for example, models S and X uh, down in the in this same period from th uh, this same period of three months from a year ago, they sold 22,319 units. Uh, this year, seventeen thousand six fifty. Even uh, after, even after uh, putting some heavy discounts out there and other incentives. So, and, and then of course, as you know, Will, they recently talked about this uh, launched this Model Y, which is the smaller SUV. It's the it's the Model Three. It's what the Model Three is to the right. S to the X. Holy moly! Keep all the letters together. The Model Y, and there's some speculation that the Model Y will completely consume the uh, assembly line for the Model S and they'll just get rid of it. Uh, you think so? There's some speculation that that's the case and they think people think that's why Elon responded the way that he did yeah. instead of being like, yeah, we're on a schedule of like a year from now or something for an update. Yeah. Just no. So again, this, I'm just, this is all speculation based on information that's out there, based on the tweets and... And, uh, and so forth. But I think it's a big problem for Tesla. Obviously, making, making high-tech, futuristic cars 
electric cars, vehicles at scale, very difficult thing to do. And they've got to make decisions. They got to make hard decisions from a, a production capacity standpoint. Like it actually hasn't been sales that have been holding them back. It's deliveries, right? It's getting, making the cars as fast as people want them. Uh, they, they feel like maybe a lot of buyers aren't, aren't embracing the brand because right now, if you, if you buy one, you're waiting like a month. I mean, depending on what you buy, but that's not the case if you go to any other car company, Will. You want to go buy a Ford or a Toyota, you can buy it today, yeah. you know, and, and so that's kind of compelling. So they got to get better in that department, and maybe what they need is a simplification of the lineup, and maybe that's what, what's being uh, implied here. Now, the other speculation is that uh, because the sales are slumping, he doesn't want people to hold off anymore that are waiting for a refresh. Because you know what you would do, Will, is like if you knew a new phone was coming out, let's say, you'll be like, I'm going to hold off till it comes out. And because the Model S and X are dated now, you might have been like, I'm going to hold off for six months, see if anything happens, see if it gets a revamp, and then I'll buy it. So maybe it's a tactic where they are working on a refresh, but it's like, I'm going to put this message out there, no, so people feel confident enough to buy it as it is right now. So it could be either tactic. I'm not stating it's one or the other, but Tesla's going to continue to have this very unusual path towards success. Uh, they've done some amazing things that I, I feel like I, it would have been difficult to predict that they would have been capable of doing even what they've done to this point. Right. Very ambitious, very amazing. Obviously, everyone's well aware. But uh, they're going to have to take these unusual, this unusual path because of what they're up against, because of the difficulty involved in the whole process. Not just designing the car, not just taking in the orders, but actually making all these cars, updating them, changing parts. It's crazy, dude. It's crazy. You make one change to the Model S, it's like it's a whole new, it's all new stuff to go wrong. Making cars is hard. On Very top hard. of that, working with like uh, other companies like SpaceX and boring companies. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot going on. But I, I think insane. right now, the only modern Tesla, like the, the vision for the future Tesla is the three. The other ones are basically what they were and what they have been. The, 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 I'm not saying that you, you shouldn't buy an S or whatever. Like you, you, again, it's bigger. It has different attributes. But the three is the closest to, I think, where Tesla has to go and, and where the vision goes. The vision follows the three right now. And obviously that's, outlined with the why and so forth and uh the roadster's coming out still too so 2.0 yeah i mean supposedly that's an even tougher one low low volume holy moly we're not even gonna go there uh in moments of anger steve jobs was highly critical of tim cook says biographer walter isaacson this is via cnbc walter isaacson was the guy who wrote the the biography on jobs and released it just like shortly after Steve Jobs passed away, he was like he was like running these interviews as Steve's illness was progressing. Mm -hmm. Walter Isaacson, and it was the his it was his book that led a lot of people to to sort of criticize Jobs' behavior and uh, and think of him not in the greatest light from a personality perspective. That he was hard to work with. That he's hard on people and things like this. Maybe not the greatest father. All this criticism. Uh, everything came out of that book where it was sort of the most candid that Jobs had been, knowing that he was at the end of his life, that he kind of was a little bit more loose, yeah. loose-lipped as, as far as what he's willing to say. And so, as you know, Johnny Ive recently left Apple. It, 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 it brought this huge conversation about the future of Apple, the history of Apple, and sort of the, the, the key to Apple's magic and success up until this point. And there was some speculation that possibly... Johnny Ive and Tim Cook weren't lining up, weren't syncing up. Of course, Johnny Ive, the designer behind most of the products that Steve also gets credit for, Steve Jobs. And so there's this, this rumor that, that Tim never was never really a product guy, that he never visited the design studio, that he's more interested on a back-end type working, sales figures, things like this, that that was more his, his mindset. And so Isaacson uh, has, has come out and said that it goes a bit deeper than that, and essentially that Steve kind of knew 
what the limitations of Tim's personality or Tim Tim's vision uh, were. So on the record, because Isaacson softened up the story in the book to be nice to people, according to himself, on the record, Steve said, Tim Cook can do everything. Then he looked at me and said, Tim's not a product person. So he contradicted himself immediately. So Steve seemed to know, and I mean, apparently off the record, he was even a little bit more harsh, according to Walter Isaacson. So this kind of uh, points in a similar direction to the speculation around the Ive Cook relationship and why they may have not necessarily gotten along and why Ive may have checked out a little bit in the absence of Job, according to uh, Jobs. According to Isaacson, Jobs was in a design studio every day. Uh, 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 stressing over minor details every day. You kick people out, close the door. It was intense. You know, he was, a, in, he was an intense guy, a different type of leadership, a different type of individual from, from Cook. Now, it's important to note that Jobs was part of the group that selected Cook to be the future CEO of the company. Uh, so maybe he thought even with that, uh, shortcoming in that department, he would still be the best CEO. He maybe thought that, or maybe other people persuaded him. It's hard to know for certain. But for me, when I read something like this and, and I sort of uh, attempt to imagine the environment that would have existed pre-iPhone, the intensity that I've seen Jobs speak with in interviews, you can only... You, you can't help but envision... An environment in which Steve is there, Johnny's there, they're in this design lab, they're talking about iPods, they're getting motivated, they're getting amped, and they're, they're thinking about changing the world, or they're thinking about big picture stuff, and they're doing so in a passionate kind of manner with a certain type of energy. That's going to be hard to maintain, it's going to be hard to continue, with a different group of individuals. And so when people on either side of the conversation say, okay, Apple's different now that Steve is gone. Apple's different now that Johnny's gone. Uh, it'll never be the same. They'll never be as successful or they'll never be as imaginative or whatever. But I think people go extreme in that department. There's a lot of people at the company, but I think there is something to it. I think there is, I think there was a certain type of electricity there. Uh, a certain type of intensity and interest there from a couple of guys who really obsessed over the product and the customer mm -hmm. and not so much the business and the supply chain and some of the elements that Tim seems to be more interested in. Now, I'm sure Tim would disagree with a lot of this, and I have no idea why Isaacson is out uh, talking about this right now at this moment, uh, possibly because of the Johnny Ive situation, probably because of the Johnny Ive situation. But I don't think Apple will ever be the same Apple. I think it's impossible when you lose personalities like that. It doesn't mean they're going to fail. It doesn't mean they're going to implode. It's just some personalities are tough to, to replace, as far as I can tell. Teens, uh, teens are leaving certain social media platforms, Will. They're upset. They're not loving it the way that the social media companies would imply or hope. Uh, but they're leaving certain social media faster than other social media, and they're more likely to use certain social media every day than other social media as well. They're logging off. They're reading books, Will. Oh, okay. You know, they're, they're, they're... Well, that's nice. They're living life, Will. Mm. You know about that. No, I don't. You're a guy. Um, I use social media. You're a guy? Yeah. <laughs> he's a guy he knows you see you go to the coffee shop Will you hang out you bring a book you got a latte guy like you is that what people do you don't have to look at social media I promise you don't actually don't have to mm -hmm. but anyway it's uh, YouTube YouTube's the big winner in this particular article so I'm happy about that and I truly believe it's because there's some utility on YouTube it's not all it's not all fluff it's not all pretty faces like ours will mm. you understand there's some real good stuff out there besides just you know 
this superficial stuff like like uh, like Otis over there <laughs> with his <laughs> special pattern on his fur he's there. A special little guy. Whatever he's got going on yeah. when he's not screaming at you. Mm. Uh, so uh, Gen Z, Gen Z, Generation Z. That's uh, people between the ages of 13 and 21. Born after 1996, they are leaving Facebook. So Facebook leads the list on this graph of social media they used to use but don't use anymore. 30% of Gen Zers don't use mm. Facebook anymore and used to use it. Kick is number two at 29%. Skype, 24.6%. Twitter, 21 Instagram, 20%. Now, the Instagram one's a bit confusing because... Instagram, also the top platform that they do still use that particular group. So a dip, but not a kill, just a dip in that department. Now, in response to which platforms participants check on a daily basis, Instagram was 64.59% still. YouTube was in close second at 62.48. Snapchat in third at 51. And Facebook in fourth at 34. So they can still go further, but... Gen Z, they are leaving these platforms to a certain degree. And last up here, when a separate, a separate research study was done, survey, they found 51% of U U.S. teens between the ages of 13 and 17 use Facebook. So 50% total, 13 to 17. 85% in that same age group use YouTube, 72 use Instagram, and 69 use Snapchat. So kind of kind of similar findings. But as far as people quitting a particular platform, Facebook, top of the list, people are done with Facebook, obviously, as you can tell, especially young people, it seems. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of reasons for it. Obviously, it's competitive. Obviously, if you're using one of these platforms, it's hard to use them all. It's hard to check into all this stuff every day. I know for me, it's pretty much just YouTube out of the bunch mm -hmm. if you're talking daily i mean i'm not gen z i'm not 13 to 17 years old but it is youtube and i've told you in the past one of the reasons i think i stick to youtube specifically is i do get those little tidbits i do get some meaning i get some utility out of it and i don't have that feeling as frequently on the other social media probably put twitter next myself i put instagram further down the list and put facebook at the bottom myself if i'm ranking yeah, I mean, we talked about this. YouTube always has something interesting. Right. It, it caters to everyone, and it's it's a visual. It's it's video, so people can look for whatever they want. Right. You know. But I think I think because of that, YouTube has the potential to give you that kind of you know the moment of like ah yeah the moment of like huh yeah the moment of like wow absolutely okay. Interesting. Or even the moment of, uh, how do I fix my air conditioner? Yeah. Like, utility. Mm -hmm. oh, do that on Instagram. The other day, you were trying to search for the guy who posted the Kawhi Leonard thing on, on Snapchat. It's like, what do you even search? What's going on here? Yeah. Where are we? Mm -hmm. Where are we right now? That was you on <laughs> Snapchat. Swimming. You were trying to swim swimming within blind. Snapchat. It was yeah. a bad idea. Uh, YouTube makes you feel less guilty because if you control your experience, you can actually find value. V and value, I get it, it's a hard thing to really pinpoint, like what is value? But I like to think of it as utility, usefulness, if it transcends sort of just the uh, entertainment component, which can be a bit empty at times. It's that extra little piece which you leave with some knowledge or you leave with some, some uh, uh, instruction, possibly a tutorial, those exist on YouTube. I mean, imagine posting a tutorial on Instagram. Or Snapchat, like what? I don't. I mean, I guess somebody they, probably they do, but it's like a lot of compilation, and they do it so quick. It's like you That's don't right. really get the. It's not really for that. Effect. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyhow, I mean, I guess I can ask you guys. You're, you're, you're. They're, some of you are Gen Z. They're Gen Z. Uh, they're all, all every other Gen as well. So you tell me if you had to quit one social media right now forever, which one would it be? And also, which is the most important to you? Although I think. This is a bit skewed since you're probably watching this on YouTube. But anyhow, I think a lot of people will, will line up with this actual chart right here. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, quite possible. Viking grave discovery in Sweden leaves archaeologists stunned. What do you know about Vikings, Will? Uh, Nordic. Go on. Folk. Go on. 
Um, go they on. Got, they got steel hats. Go on. With horns and. Go on. They're super strong. You nailed it, Will. <laughs> just when I think I've got you, you just climb right out of it. You say, what? Vikings? No problem. Mm -hmm. I got it. Vikings have a really cool type of burial. Like a very cool funeral. Oh, really? Yeah, I kind of want one. Like if I go down, I'll tell you what, I kind of want a Viking funeral. Mm. Kirk knows about it. They put you in the boat because, you know, they were on the sea a lot. They dominated. So they put you on the boat, Will. Put it out to sea. There's like rocks on it. Something and then they and then they burn it with the arrow. Oh, they the flaming arrow. Mm. The boat is gone. It's burning. You go off in the distance, uh, like a hero, man. Come on, don't you want that? How cool is that? You yeah. don't want you don't want that. Well, you just no, no, no. It sounds really cool. I'm trying to paint a picture. In just put head. it in. Just put it in your will, and I'll make sure it happens. Okay. okay. Yeah. You want that too? Oh wait, put it in there. Yeah. See what I mean, man? It's cool. I mean, I'm not saying we need to do it anytime soon. I'm just saying as far as a way to go, like you really, that's a send off. So anyhow, that was common practice back then, particularly for important uh, citizens, important members of the group would get these types of elaborate uh, burials. But I like it because it's like environmental too. You imagine seeing like a flaming boat in the distance whew, and knowing your brother's on there. Well, not your brother specifically, but you know what I mean? Your brother yeah. in arms mm -hmm. is on there. What a moment as a group. So anyhow, they found, uh, they found a new Viking boat grave. And uh, it, it was just a routine dig. Where was it? It's in north of Stockholm, 46 miles north of Stockholm. And they were shocked to unearth this uh, Viking boat grave. They found some uh, various material. One of the interesting things that they found there, a comb, an ornate comb, comb, you know, like comb for your hair. Or oh, for your beard, yeah. Or for your beard. You you picture a Viking with a beard, yeah, don't exactly. you? So do yeah, I. Yeah. So do I. All Vikings have beards in my head. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, there's, there, what, a cool, like, what a cool job being an archaeologist. If I didn't do this, that's what I would do. I would quit, and that's what I would do. Because I just, this, this stuff to me is, I mean, like, look, oh, at the the comb. look at the preservation on it. That's the comb, right? That's the right. comb. Very Look at the cool. preservation on it. You're talking about many, many years ago. They haven't had an excavation like this in that region in over 50 years. And uh, they believe that the area was an important religious, economic, and political set settlement as far back as the 3rd century. So it's rich in historic remains. So anyway, there you go. A little history for you, Will. Got to let the people know about the Vikings. Yeah. They were out there conquering. And because of that, they got the coolest burials. And also, I guess because of those burials, ended up with uh, some decent preservation of remains, in this case, in Sweden. How Very about cool. that? There you go. That's, that's how I picture a Viking. I don't know. It could be, is it wrong? I don't know. I'm sure they, when they did the TV show, <laughs> they had to like at least have some... Uh, Use some historic data to to, ref, to reflect the costume. So 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 di imagine this dude coming into your town, oh, holding a battle axe. Kirk, what are you gonna do, man? No, you're done. No, no, you might as well go crawl into your canoe grave. Right away, yeah, right away. What, like hand over an arrow. Yeah, yeah, that's what you gotta do. I remember this dude. He this was, is the real he was Viking. That, the mountain, right? Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. Is he Game of Thrones? <laughs> that's, not his, uh, that's not his real name. No, I know. <laughs> in, the, in the show. Yeah. His real name is like Magnus and Thor Magnus. Yeah, I remember. I saw Something this guy. I saw this it. guy trying to fight Conor McGregor back pre Floyd yep. Mayweather. Speaking yep. of Floyd Mayweather, did, he got crossed he over. He got wobbly knees. Did you see that? Yeah. Jack would like that. Yeah. Jack's a big McGregor fan. What's going on? Is he going to fight again? Nah, probably not. Yeah, Jack's got no news for us. He's our insider in that department. Uh, anyway, Will, were you just trying to get Game of Thrones in here somehow again? <laughs> They're coming out with the new Game of Thrones. And I was like, Willie, dude, they got a prequel thing going on. You're going to watch it? He's like, no, get it away from me. Uh -huh. I was like, what? I thought you were a fan. I feel like Game of Thrones people, they're just done. It was just enough already, I guess. But there's probably people in the audience that they can't wait for the prequel. 
Hundred yeah. kingdoms. Hundred kingdoms. Well, you can't. Yeah. Yeah. You never run out with this stuff. Yeah, it goes with on fantasy, and on. it just keeps going. It goes on. If you got fans, why not? Keep going. That's mm -hmm. what people are looking for. They want prequels. They want kingdoms. They want Starks. Go for it. Why not? HBO, they got to figure something out, right? I and mean, what are people supposed to... Yeah. You know, how do you replace Game of Thrones? They maybe never will. They maybe never will. Yeah. All right, last up. You know, it's the uh, recent segment we started here in which uh, there's I analyze, I watch the top trending video on the trending tab of YouTube and give you a little breakdown so we know what's going on in the world. You know, not just tech, but like better cultural representation of what matters to people. And I was actually surprised today to find a video from John Tron because like number two has 16 million views and his video has 1.9, but his is ahead of that. So that's kind of interesting. But anyhow, I guess maybe because it's more fresh. It's a day old compared to two days old. But anyway, uh, nonetheless, it's kind of a weird top trending video. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty classic you, YouTuber updating his audience, responding to comments, mm. and like, here's where I've been, here's what I'm doing type of video. Uh, I went on to watch a couple of his videos after this. Th this video in particular, a fireside chat with with John Tron, he addresses a very particular type of comment that he gets within his audience of kind of, when's the next video? Where have you been? You should publish more videos. And then also the criticism of, you should make the videos you used to make. Which is like, if, if you've ever spent any time on YouTube publishing videos, you know this comment. <laughs> you know this comment very well. For some reason, there's a, uh, particularly when it comes to the stuff, to, to the vid videos or video style that you've made previously, where people will say, where people feel strongly that that's the thing you were made for mm. and therefore should continue to do. Mm. And in their defense, that's what might be the time in which they signed up. But I think more than that, I think it has more to do with that person's stage in their lives, remembering fondly than it does with their actual daily activities of today. I'm just speculating right now, but the reason for my speculation is because, for example, on our channel, people will say, you gotta make videos. Where's all the cool products? You're doing too many videos on phones, let's say, for example, comment, comment, comment. You can then go make a video on some random gadget and it gets like half the views. And it's like, oh, this commenter might be telling the truth, but they also, are obviously not representative of the majority of the audience. Or, on top of that, they may think that's what they want, but in reality, the reality might not measure up exactly in that department. At least, again, from an analytic standpoint, the numbers don't lie. Now, obviously, when a channel's been going on for a long time, a channel like ours upstairs on Box Therapy, 15 million subscribers or, or close to it, uh, there's a lot of different people that want a lot of different things, obviously. But in John Tron's case, he's facing a similar thing where there, he used to make uh, videos about video games, uh, cri criti critical com uh, comedy criticism type videos about video games. I guess he hasn't done one in a long time. And so the audience is coming in with, you should do that. What's wrong with you? You're not doing what you should be doing type of thing. And he's kind of saying, hey, I got to do, I'm doing what I think is best for this era right now for where I'm at and, and, and so on and so forth. So it's your, it's your classic dilemma, your classic YouTuber dilemma. Anyways, the other part of the show, uh, of this particular clip, is in relationship to YouTube's policies. He's been hit by demonetization in a couple of cases. And he goes over the demonetization policies and kind of talks about how they're very vague. And this actually spoke to me because ever since we started on this channel, talking more broadly, not specifically product centric uh it's been a similar experience for me of like trying to interpret the vagueness of it and watching the demonetization pop up here and there and then go away at some point and particularly this one that he highlighted on controversial issues and sensitive events uh sensitive events including war uh controversial issues including political conflict so we spoke about hong kong 
in the past. If you, as soon as you show any kind of like protest imagery or talk about it, demonetization. And now, um, in his case, I'm not sure which circumstance, or he does talk about which circumstance led to it. But anyway, it was it was another kind of vague gray area that led to it. In our case, and, and in the way you might interpret that, you might say, oh, Lou, well, why does that matter? Like, so what? It's You can still, you still can freely speak about what you want because you can still post it, even if it's demonetized. This is my initial th th uh, thought process on it as well. It's like, okay, well, they're not really shutting down speech because you can still post it. But it kind of maneuvers it a bit because the moment at which you're doing this particular job as a profession, you have to be interested in whether or not it's a, v a valid piece of content for monetization because that's essentially what allows you to continue to do it. And so you may be able to talk about this more sensitive stuff, but you're probably going to just loosely shy away from it. You're probably just going to be like, oh, well, skip it and do something different. Like even just casually, you know what I'm saying? Because you know that these stipulations exist. So the effect of this is that the bigger voices that are out there will stay away from potentially important subject matter almost subconsciously because they'll condition themselves to kind of just like leave that particular topic alone in which you would have otherwise thrown it in, mentioned it, maybe had a take, maybe discussed it as human beings would. See, oftentimes on this show, for example, we'll start out the show talking about what we talk about, then we'll roll the clips and it'll be like stuff that's been selected and sort of like, not that that's a bad thing, preparation is good, like you have things you wanna talk about and cover, things that you think are important. But like, you also, to a certain extent, the casual nature of discourse and conversation uh, can't exist in its purest form in an environment like this. Now I get it, ultimately advertisers decide, right? They are in the driver's seat. They run the whole site essentially uh, because they they pay the bills. They pay I mean, everybody's bills. I mean, there's no none of this great stuff exists without the subsidization. I don't think the platform would have ever been uh, as successful as it has been under any other model. In my opinion, if you were asking people to pay for YouTube to distribute that to content creators in the early days, no one would have done it. So then guys like me wouldn't have hopped on a platform because it wouldn't have been a viable thing to do. It wouldn't have been a responsible thing to do in my own personal circumstance at the time. There had to be an avenue and the audience was only ready for one particular level of investment and the content creators were only could only do it knowing that there was some degree of expectation that could be met because of that transaction. Mm -hmm. So I get all that, but I'm just saying it's a slippery slope and you start to wonder about how conversations are shaped by this policy. I never experienced it before, before I came down here and started speaking on more topics. Upstairs, it never happens in Unbox Therapy. There's never demonetization. But now it really, it sort of plays tricks on how you, how you view certain subject matter and the stuff that you avoid. And if you edit yourself in any kind of way and you start to realize that even that soft edit can, 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 can really have a massive impact on the overall discourse, mm -hmm. that soft edit. And so there's always gonna be channels out there that are a bit more loose with it than others. And in certain cases within this demonetization policy, there's good reason for it. Like mm -hmm. there's some stuff where it's really understandable. Then there's other stuff where it's a little bit tougher. And I know we've talked about this in the studio previously, like even channels like CNN and stuff that that show uh, uh, sensitive subject matter, there there's ads there. Right. So maybe it should just pull from some other ad pool instead of being so black and white where it's like ads on, ads off. Maybe it's like you're in, this is a grade D. Like for movies, you know, you have PG, PG-15. Exactly. And then the advertisers can select what they're willing to advertise against. I mean, I think that the system has to become more sophisticated to protect right. to protect the type of conversation that people approach on the platform. That's my opinion. That was a big part of uh, John Tron's video as well. Anyway, good on him, by the way. Number one on trending, uh, two million views on an update video. You never see this, mm -hmm. so I can I can pretty much guarantee that this this man matters very much to his audience. Uh, I think that's those are some really impressive figures to pull on a on an update video. How many subscribers does he have? 
5 million. So five, five and a half million subscribers to get 2 million views on an update video. Just like, hey, I'm going to respond to a couple things in a robe beside a TV with flames on it. <laughs> I mean, this, the, that, that guy has a real relationship with his audience to be able to do that. And uh, I find that, I think that's very impressive. So, so good for him. And also I watched a couple of his clips. So uh, yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, it's your funny kind of uh, commentary, uh, critical commentary. Yeah. Of like clips from around the web or products that are bogus and stuff like that, so you you probably want to go go check it out. Good good for you, John. Trying an update video at two milli views. I'm telling you, I don't see this every day. Top of trending, well done. Shout out. All right, Will, you got something for us? You got a question? What do you what do you have for us today, Will? Uh, just a quick one here. You got a quick one? I got a quick one. I don't believe you. So how about some space news? Uh, Richard Branson's space unit to go public. Um, I don't know if we talked about this, but uh, Virgin Galactic, it's a space tourism uh, venture from Richard Branson. Basically, it allows people to go to space, right? Um, and recently, there's a company, uh, Capital Social Capital Hedosophia Holdings. What a they, name. Yeah, they almost got you there, Will. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, they uh, are planning to invest $800 million in Virgin Galactic. So probably uh, space travel is coming sooner than we think. Wow. $800 million bucks. That's quite a few bucks. Yeah. So right now, um, there's 600 tickets that were sold, um, which equals to, I think, $80 million. But this is just the thing where you go up. You, you go up, you come down. Yeah. That's yeah. all it is. You go you might, up. You might travel around the planet a little bit and then maybe come back. You go up, you come yeah. down. Yeah. Is but hey, a, yeah, I mean. I, how appealing is that? What would you pay for that, Will? You go up, you come down. I mean, I wouldn't pay $130,000. That's is what it is right now? A ticket is. Holy yeah. moly. Okay. What would you pay? Uh, maybe yeah, you, like a... Uh, Five grand. <laughs> You're I paying mean, five G's for that? I mean, to say that I've been in space, not a lot of people can say that. You, you, Willie Do, are dropping five on that right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll drop five G's. Jeez oh, yeah. Wheeze, man. Jack? But there has to be like food and stuff. Food. He needs food, some room. snacks on the way up. Yes. I'm not sure, dude. You're going to be a little woozy going up there. I don't know. Yeah. You, you pay. No, you just go up, you come down. There are no details so far. It, you go up, you come down, Jack. Jack's in for five. Kirk? Kirk's bailing. 50 bucks. 50 yeah. bucks. Yeah, okay. see. I mean, I don't know. It's a cool story, but I don't know what... I have no idea what the experience would be like. Obviously, going to space, it's like this human achievement. We're all wrapped up in it. Space race, moon landing. Like, to be close to that at all, I can understand the appeal, especially yeah. if you're like a space fan, science fan. But as you stated, it's uh, really cost prohibitive at the moment. It's for, oh, yeah. for for very wealthy people. But who knows? Maybe with this investment, maybe they find a way, scale a little bit, get the cost down, and it becomes this uh, it becomes this vacation thing that people that a lot of people do. It's like, hey, we head down to where it probably does it launch from Florida? I guess I don't know. <laughs> it's all because that's where NASA is, right? They're they're, they're down there. Yeah. So. Maybe uh, California. I don't know where it launches from, but you head up, you come back. Uh, seems I don't know. Seems pretty elaborate for the time being, but it's a step. It's definitely a step, and the investment is an indication that they're. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming they did did some math. They pro they probably can map out a certain amount of demand. There's a lot of really wealthy people too. Yep. That are just like running out of things to do. They're bored, and they're like, I got to do with it. I got to do something with this hundred grand. Exactly. I think I haven't gone to space yet. Yeah. So why not space? Let's give it a shot. I'm sure the experience is cool. You get you got to get launched up in a rocket. I mean, if you like roller coasters, that's a roller coaster. It's a lot of genius. Yeah, you need some pretty serious velocity to bust bust the atmosphere there. Yeah, it's weird. Um, Jeff Bezos says you um, they he has a space company called Blue Origin. Elon Musk has SpaceX. They're both for I guess transport delivery. Uh, Blue Origins thinking about mining asteroids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know this is a, this is first stage stuff. Yeah, it's important to know. Like they're 
they're moving along with various plans and their their plans are more dynamic than what we're saying it's not just strictly you go up you come down they're they're trying to set the stage for all kinds of eventual space stuff they want to make it fun space travel <laughs> is that that's what he's saying because he's the well fun yeah guy. he he's all about tourism the other yeah. the other companies are all about like you know, utility. He's always that's, fun. That's he's like coming the, in. He's skydiving. Yeah. He's got the he island. He's wearing flip flops. He's the yeah. fun CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, a lot of them are going for that now, but he's the OG he is, yeah. of being a fun CEO. All right. Well, good luck to them. Uh, don't blow the 800 million. That's almost a billion. You got a question today for us, Will? Yep. Oh, if you want to send your question, will at lulater.com. What do you got? So, uh, questions for Lou later. China and U.S. relationship. This is from TC. Uh, first of all, I love your show. My question is, what will America be without China? And what will China be without America? Much love from Taiwan. Oof. Of course, it comes from Taiwan as well, right? In the yeah. middle of the whole situation. Mm. Geographically, sitting between, and then also from an industrial standpoint. Uh... You know what? I think they're going to get it sorted out. I think they're going to get it. So I think that, I know that's crazy, but business, man, is business. Yeah, just give them another G20 meeting. It's just like it, it doesn't it doesn't work out eventually. It doesn't work out like splitting the whole thing up. All of this is tactics. It's all te temporary negotiation measures. I guess there's a possibility you can you can end up in a permanent lock. But if I had a bet right now, I'm not betting on I I wouldn't bet on a permanent lock just because there's too much too much immediate and long-term downside for the parties involved, particularly China, I would say. Uh America without China is pretty much what we talked about early in the episode. It's manufacturers you moving their products destined for the U.S. to places near China. That's what it looks like and, and is like in the immediate sense. Vietnam, Taiwan, another one, this question coming from Taiwan. So do you think Americans really care if their product is stamped with China or Taiwan or Thailand or Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam? Like, I think what's happened in re re more recent history here is that those other countries surrounding China have adopted some of the manufacturing prowess that exists in China, which is part of the reason why these manufacturers can, can quickly move operations to those places. At least that's what the news seems to suggest at this moment in time. And it's everything. I mean, we reported on the, the bike, that bike company moving production from China to Taiwan. And then you have game consoles going to Vietnam and wherever else, as we talked about in this episode. So... I don't think this is going to stop any products from reaching the U.S. The cu customers, people holding the money, get the services. They get the goods. Eventually, the goods find the money. On the flip side, we've seen how some of the China without America uh, situation has impacted certain companies like Huawei, uh, where it, it just it, it made things super complicated almost immediately. Now, granted, the same thing exists for China that exists for America in the sense that a lot of the products that would be imported, they can get from elsewhere. A lot of them. The intellectual property stuff, the blueprints, the patents, and the chip designs and stuff, those are more complicated. But we live in Canada, and they stopped importing, what, was it pork or chicken or beef? I don't know. Yeah, some sort of meat. Some sort of meat. They're just like, okay, we're done with that because of the, again, relating to the Huawei beef beef yeah. you see that with the uh cfo of the company who's detained currently on behalf of trump it's also complicated but the world is a is is massive in this department in terms of like where to get your things the world is massive and both countries will find ways in the interim around a relationship around having to have a relationship but long term these two GDPs, these two populations are so massive that there, there is tremendous benefit that could be had if you can find common ground. Tremendous benefit for all involved to have m more people contributing and participating, cooperating and so forth. So that's the ideal scenario 
that said, my uh, experience in this department is limited as far as like what it is that's holding them apart and whether or not the ideological bridges can be get can be uh, yeah. whether they can span those yeah. because you hear people in the defense department in the U.S. that are like, look, they it has to be a more democratic place. There has to be some kind of election. It has to be, map more accordingly to what we're aware of in order for, for example, for us to consider allowing Huawei into our marketplace from a, from a telco perspective. You, you see this type of conversation happening and they can, they can solve that problem by going to these, these uh, countries that are nearby almost instantly. I think, I think it's two things that could happen. They could remain in gridlock. They could remain within their own independent ideologies. China could loosen up or the U.S. could loosen up. I don't see the U.S. loosening up, not with the current leader. <laughs> but, hey, it's possible. We'll see what happens. I mean, it's this. look, this question is above my pay grade, obviously. <laughs> but it's very interesting to me, nonetheless. Yep. Like, it's very interesting to me. I read about this almost every day. It's a curious thought. I mean, I just remember my own history, uh, like, my own life. I know my own life, Will. Oh, you, okay. you might be surprised by that. Oh. And, uh, you know, my childhood, speaking specifically to to uh, TC here, or Chun from Taiwan, I had a lot of products made in Taiwan as a kid that were all my toys. Oh. I, I had cars and like a lot of stuff came from Taiwan and then and Japan bef as well before that. And it wasn't up until recently that China really started to dominate. And I'm 30, I was born in 1985, I'm 34. And so, I you know, you can imagine people even older than me that can remember stuff coming from elsewhere. Uh -huh. The, 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 Global source for products has moved around over time in the manufacturing department. It has moved around. It can move around. I think that's the story here. It can move around. It doesn't have to be China. Uh, that said, I've been to China. I've been to manufacturing facilities, and I have an appreciation for, for what comes out of there and, and the fact that many of the innovations and products that end up in my pocket, that that's their origin currently, and I like those products. So time will tell how well these other countries can truly step in. And uh, I know Samsung, another one manufacturing in Vietnam. So I have to assume it, uh, as far as our products are concerned, it might be business as usual. We'll see, Will. Anyway, there it is. Uh, we, we covered it all. We went everywhere. We went to space. Um, we talked about a folding wristwatch that'll, I mean, it's a long ways off. The Xbox stuff is cool with the, with the cloud gaming. It's only a matter of time. Elon Musk is playing games with the next Tesla. He's, 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 his, his lips are sealed if it's in production or he doesn't, or, or there's no, no new version coming. So take that for what it's worth. Top of trending, bit of a surprise for the day. Uh, a lot going on. Teens are leaving certain social media and it might be for the better as far as I'm concerned. Uh, teens, if you, listen to me, teens. Are you a teen? Get yourself outdoors, all right? Smell some fresh air. Uh, take a trip, you know, take, uh, go into the woods. It doesn't, not a big trip. Don't spend a lot of money. Don't, don't, I don't want you booking plane tickets, all right? Stop. Don't do that. No Coachella? No! No Coachella, all right? No photo ops, no special outfits. Change nothing about any of that. I just want nearby, somewhere nearby that's easily accessible and cheap to get to, but is in nature. Go this weekend and be in nature. That's it. You can cut it there.